We uh, will have a special event. Um, I told my sections that um, Lucille Eichengreen, who was uh, scheduled to speak in the survivor panel, has been invited to return to Europe to commemorate the 60th anniversary of the end of the war. And uh, she'll be in Europe on the 4th. Yes? We'll be meeting from 4 until 5.40. Students in my section at 6 o'clock, um, you can do section attendance earlier. If you can't be there, you need to talk to me. Um, and we can do that on Thursday. We are moving the readings for Lucia Lichen Green up, so you should have them read by a week from Thursday. I sent out an email to my students, and I would like to um, tell the rest of you that we received an email from the people at Northlight Books, and they're going to be returning books to the publisher probably next week. If you haven't purchased your books as yet, it suggests that you get over there and get them. If a little short of cash and you need to buy them slowly, just call Northlight. Their phone number is in your syllabus, and ask them to hold uh, the books that you might need for you. Okay. They're really wonderful people. That's why we do business with them. Anybody have any questions before we begin? OK. One of the things that's occurred to us as faculty is that <coughs> digesting the history of the Holocaust and all of its antecedents or the things that led up to it is a pretty daunting task. Do we have any history majors here? Okay. Our history majors probably don't see it as daunting as uh, some of the other majors. In addition to there being a lot of facts, um, there is, however, a kind of um, logic that we can follow that gives us some idea of why the Holocaust and how did the Holocaust happen. Today what we're going to do is see a very good documentary called Master Race 1933, which shows us the evolution of German society into a society where uh, there was complicity with genocide. Does a pretty good job of explaining in visual form some of the things, if not all of the things, that you've learned from War and Genocide, your major text. Because of that, you're going to see some things that you may recognize. And hopefully, those images will help you um, integrate some understanding of how the Holocaust happened. Using that information with some of the information that you've had before, um, including the longest hatred and the lecture on the sociology of genocide, I'm hoping that that will solidify some ideas for you as you create your first response paper. After that documentary, I'm going to have a few things, very briefly, to say about how is the Holocaust represented in film. We will have seen a documentary, and then we are going to see two examples of how you might, not might, how people have been introduced to the Holocaust through film, two very different ways. Um, and we'll have some questions for you. I hope you'll write them on your, uh, the back of your attendance sheet. 
and we'll see if we have enough time for some discussion here. If not, we certainly will do it in section. So, Lauren, if you can get the lights, and Jessica, if you could get uh, the video. And I need someone to get that door, please. We'll start with Master Race 1933. to you by Conseco, where we believe that leaping at certain financial opportunities can make a secure financial future harder to grasp. Conseco, our goal is to help you protect wealth, create wealth for life. Major funding for People's Century was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the annual financial support of viewers like you. Additional funding was provided by the Lowell Institute. Berlin, 1933. The National Socialists come to power, and the German people take the first steps down a new road. They will be asked to put their trust in a set of ideas based on race, military strength, and authoritarian government. A sea of swastikas. We were out in the streets and went to the Brandenburg Gate watch the Nazis marching into power. Restaurants were open almost all night. People were drinking. There was a huge commotion. We were shocked by this incredible upsurge and the sudden swing to the Nazis. Millions of ordinary Germans allow themselves to be persuaded that they are a special people with a special destiny. And they are drawn into a horror unique in the history of civilization. The Nazis rode to power through the strong leadership of one man. Adolf Hitler had never won an election. He became chancellor through a political deal. He blamed Germany's problems on her unjust treatment by the Allies after the First World War and on weak German politicians in the Depression years that followed. Now the days of party politics were over. He would embody the national will. Heute. Weiß es das ganze Volk, unser Wille war härter als die deutsche Not. Nach 15-jähriger Verzweiflung hat ein großes Volk wieder Trüb gefasst. Germans attracted by the promise of a more orderly and united society had to accept his methods. 
He took total power immediately and put political opponents into concentration camps. The Nazis burnt books by left-wingers and Jewish intellectuals. Many Germans were socialists or communists, but to the Nazis, these were dangerous ideologies to be purged. There was to be no more industrial conflict. Trade unions were banned, and all workers had to join a Nazi labor front. During the Depression, unemployment had reached 30 percent. Now industry revived as Hitler strove to rearm Germany and give every German worker a job. The party gathered support in every factory. In town and country. Help was sent to the farmers, many driven bankrupt in the Depression. All over Germany, people were swept into massive demonstrations of party unity. Harvest Festival was staged as a grand celebration a mixture of new ideas and revived old customs. The thousands of people you can see all around were farmers, young people from all over Germany. We traveled in special trains and then marched for hours to get as close to the front as possible. I was right at the front. We all felt the same, the same happiness and joy. Harvest Festival was the thank you for us farmers having a future again. Things were looking up. I believe no statesman has ever been as loved as Adolf Hitler was then. It's all come flooding back to me. Those were happy times. To give work to the unemployed, Hitler launched huge public works projects. Two and a half thousand miles of Autobahn were announced, linking major cities. I was one of the first radio reporters to drive on the Autobahn. There were thousands and thousands of people watching with great excitement. Of course, I reported that it was a great achievement which we should be proud of and which would be repeated. In the propaganda, the road builders were held up as an example of national socialism in action. Also, wir haben ja 
For a long time, we believed everything that came over the radio. The young people were the most excited by the propaganda. Over 90% of us were behind everything that went on. To make sure every family could get the message, cheap radios were mass-produced. State radio put across one idea above all else. In a word, the greatness of the German people. Propaganda gave people a big boost in confidence for the first time. One way to build national unity was to blame Germany's problems on the Jews. The Nazis drew on old hatreds, old jealousies towards the Jews. They were much slyer in business than the normal German and Austrian and they were so excellent in literature and in theaters and in cinema and in science. More than 50% of the medicine doctors in Vienna were Jews, more than 70% of the lawyers. And of course, all that made for a strong and hardline anti-Semitism. Of Germany's half million Jews, only a minority were ultra-Orthodox. The Bodenheimer family in a Berlin suburb saw themselves first and foremost as Germans. This is my brother Edgar and I, we were very, very close. These are my parents in the garden. My father was a banker. I put the cigar in his mouth. I enjoyed it when he smoked. I was in my family the only person who looked Jewish. And Germans were very aware of how people looked and, and were very attuned to discovering a Jew. I remember as a little girl walking somewhere and some stranger would pass me and say, dirty Jew. In April 1933, Hitler and Goebbels ordered a nationwide boycott of Jewish-owned businesses. Most Germans stood by and watched as shops were picketed and defaced. It was a frightening experience. It was a shock. And my mother was the one who said, we must leave Germany. And it's almost to the day a year later, we were all out, had officially emigrated. I still admire her for her guts and her gut feelings, and uh, I think we were very lucky, very lucky. The Nazis created a historical myth to support their ideas.
purebred Germans were naturally superior because they were the descendants of noble medieval knights from a less degenerate age of verdant forests and Aryan blood. Germans were told their ancestors had been a uniquely advanced, cultured race. Cooperative archaeologists dug up bogus relics as evidence. Deutsche Mutter Erde tut sich auf, um Kunde zu geben von der hohen Kulturstufe unserer frühesten Vorfahren. The successors of the Teutonic Knights were the men of the elite SS. I personally was in the SS. Racial, Nordic, selected people, and we shall be the future aristocratic uh, spine bone of the German nation. Well, I thought, wonderful, no? And I felt myself uh, very much flattered by being chosen for this, and then the uniform was very beautiful, black, no? Of course we liked the uniform and the boots and all that, no? The SS had begun as Hitler's bodyguards. Now they became the spearhead in the drive to confirm the German people as the master race. So sind wir angetreten und marschieren nach unabänderlichen Gesetzen. Wir gehen den Weg in eine ferne Zukunft und wünschen und glauben, wir möchten nicht nur sein die Enkel, die es besser ausfochten, sondern darüber hinaus die Ahnen spätester für das ewige Leben des deutschen und germanischen Volkes notwendiger Geschlechter. SS-Leader Hemmler asked Germans to follow Nazi genetic theories and improve the racial stock. The state gave loans to encourage healthy couples to have more children. For unusually productive mothers, there were medals. The ideal baby was racially pure and genetically fit, so partners had to be chosen with great care. I was affected by this when I married. I had to prove myself as an SS officer. All my ancestors down to 1750. And my wife, she had to fill out about 22 questions whether she likes too much dresses or perfumes. We thought that we should, we can form a new ideal race. And that we thought perfect. And I chose my wife according to this line. The new German was self-disciplined and healthy, a model many aspired to. As a young woman, Luisa Essig worked as an education officer for the Nazi farming ministry. She had to put the theory into practice among the farmers. She developed a training program that linked fitness and rural crafts with racial purity and the sanctity of the soil. The project was called Faith and Beauty, and thousands of young people learned it from Luisa. I developed farming study groups and we had sports and so on. I took my suggestions to Berlin and they were all accepted. And so the Faith and Beauty scheme for girls was launched. And in the countryside we set up these two groups studying the farming profession and rural lifestyles. A whole generation was taught to live the ideal German life the Nazis prescribed. 
local party officials regularly reminded them what it was all for. For Führer and Fatherland, that's what it was usually about. We're fighting for Führer and Fatherland, something like that. The generation that grew up together in the small village of Repner in Lower Saxony watches a film made there in the 30s at a May Day festival. The 1st of May, I was six. The flag's being hoisted. That's the pastor's house with the stork's nest on top. And the maypole being put up. There's the Young Girls League and the boys in the Hitler Youth. They've put up a swastika. I like wearing the Young Girls uniform and loved the Hitler Youth organization. I really liked it. There I am on the float playing Hansel. My brother and I are Hansel and Gretel, and Lottie's the witch. Blonde, blue-eyed, tall people were much admired. They were the flag carriers, as you can see. Ilsa carried the flag because she was pretty, tall and blonde. There I am. I'm carrying the flag. I was very proud to carry the flag. My main thought was that I'd be in the film. We weren't really swept along. We took part because everybody did. We didn't want to be left behind, so we went along with it. But not every German could be part of this shared national folk experience. The belief which held up the purebred Aryan as the ideal German condemned Jewish people as an inferior race. Jewish children were ejected from the state education system, forcing Jewish communities to set up their own schools. Between 1933 and 1935, a succession of decrees banned Jews from law, medicine, and civil service, pushing them out of the Aryan workplace and the Aryan home. I went to art school in Berlin, and we knew we weren't allowed to go out with German girls. I didn't have any German girlfriends because of the Nuremberg laws. In Aryan classrooms, children were taught to be on their guard against Jews. But first, they had to be able to spot them. Children's books like The Poisonous Mushroom were designed to help. Jews were like the death cap. They had to be picked out from the other harmless mushrooms in the forest of life. Books taught how to recognize the Jew, the molester of children, the ravisher of Aryan women, the swindler of honest Germans. The message was to get rid of them the Jews are not wanted. And this sign was not part of a fairy tale. It was put up across Germany in the late 30s. Jews are not wanted here. It was a process which developed slowly but surely and took over whole sections of the population who had never thought about it before. 
Die haben dann zum Teil auch einfach nachgefragt. A lot of them just talked about it, not necessarily believing it. But gradually their brains became fogged and they started to say the Jews are our misfortune. Der berühmte Satz, die Juden sind unser Unglück. Other groups that didn't fit in with the racial ideas of the state found themselves under pressure. In 1936, there were 45,000 gypsies in Germany holding on to their traditional itinerant way of life. of the Ernst family were Romani musicians. Anna Maria remembers the gypsy's life on the road. It was a beautiful life, wonderful, happy. There were celebrations, dancing. The women were full of vitality. Marriages were arranged. We had real gypsy weddings which lasted for six or seven days. They loved living life as free as a bird in the sky. To Nazi eyes, the gypsies were a dirty and antisocial nuisance. They accosted decent Germans in the street. They were beggars. Something would have to be done about them. Researchers went out into the field, compiling family trees, measuring the gypsies, pinning them down. Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, and blacks were graded into categories. Records were made on the basis of eye and hair color, cranium size, ancestry. Officials put it all on file, noting where they lived. So everybody had to sell caravans and belongings and move into flats. We were all made to settle down permanently and register. The wonderful life was over. The mentally ill were also said to be a danger. They threatened the genetic health of the nation. To keep handicaps from being passed on, the ill were to be forcibly sterilized. In den letzten 70 Jahren hat sich unser Volk um 50 Prozent vermehrt, während die Zahl der Erbkranken im gleichen Zeitraum um 450 Prozent gestiegen ist. Wenn diese Entwicklung so weiterliefe, würde schon in 50 Jahren auf vier gesunde Menschen ein Erbkranker kommen. Ein endloser Zug des Grauens würde in die Nation hineinmarschieren. But for those who weren't handicapped, or a gypsy, or a Jew, life was improving by 1937. Germans were regaining their pride as Hitler's aggressive diplomacy forced respect from the rest of Europe. And as the country rearmed, unemployment was cut by four million. Now Hitler offered even more. He would bring the German-speaking people of Europe together by expanding the German state. In March 1938, he absorbed Austria in defiance of the Treaty of Versailles, which had forbidden the Union. It was a euphoric moment. Most Austrians supported him.
Norbert Lopper was a 19-year-old Viennese Jew. There had always been anti-Semitism in Vienna and in Austria long before 1938. This was nothing new. But then it became official, and that made it much worse. In Austria, local Nazis were zealous in devising new insults. One day, people came and fetched my sister from home. They ordered her to scrub the streets. What was distressing was that people stood there and laughed at them. It was humiliating. The anti-Jewish campaign was accelerated. In Munich, Nazis pulled down the main synagogue. They said it was a traffic hazard. And then, in 1938, across Germany and Austria, Jews were attacked on November 9th, Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. Over 1,000 synagogues were burned. 300 Jews were killed. Over 30,000 Jews were rounded up. By January 1939, Hitler had annexed the German-speaking part of Czechoslovakia and was planning for war. But in public, he blamed any possible war on the Jews and linked their fate to it. Those who had money and could make the arrangements left the country. Nearly 120,000 Jews emigrated in 1938 and 39 alone. Aryan Germans took over their property and jobs. But it wasn't easy to get away. The lines outside the American consulate in Vienna stretched around the block. Foreign governments limited the number of emigres they would accept. And for those who sought refuge in neighboring countries, escape was short-lived. The Nazis would soon overrun much of Europe. In September 1939, the Second World War began, when the Germans invaded Poland. The Nazis were determined to expand their territory, to provide living space for Aryan Germans. The Germans divided the Poles into racial categories. The blonde, blue-eyed Poles could be turned into Germans. Others could provide slave labor, or be deported, or worse, because over three million of them were Jewish. This isn't the Second World War, said Goering. It's the Great Racial War. The trains taking German reinforcements to the front were plastered with slogans. We're off to Poland to bash the Jews. German newsreels reinforced the Nazi line. Das schwierigste Problem, vor das sich unsere Zivilverwaltung in den besetzten Gebieten gestellt sieht, ist die Judenfrage. Dieses ostjüdische Untermenschentum hat seit jeher Westeuropa das internationale Verbrechergesindel geliefert. Von hier aus wurden die Demokratien mit Taschendieben, Zuhältern, Rauschgift und Mädchenhändlern internationalen Bankschiebern und Hetzjournalisten versorgt. In Germany, the start of the war marked a change in policy toward the mentally ill and handicapped. Hitler himself signed a secret order to start putting them to death. Reinhard Spitze had heard him give his reasons. And he said, why should we spend money for a fool, for a hopeless, ill person, 
if I can do with the same money so much good for a poor peasant's kid. The decision brought the reality of racial policy home to countless ordinary families with a sick relative. Meine Mutter ist, uh, im December in December 1931, my mother had been sent to the clinic for nervous diseases in Frankfurt am Main because of depression and anxiety about her husband. Marie Rao's mother was eventually diagnosed as an incurable schizophrenic. Without her family's knowledge, she was brought to the Hadamar Psychiatric Clinic, which became a center for killing the mentally disabled. They were led to the cellar and killed with carbon monoxide gas, up to 60 at a time, over 10,000 in Hadamar alone. Next door was a crude operating slab where brains and other organs were removed for scientific research. The Rouse were told their mother had died of complications from warts on her lip. They only learned the truth years later. The fact that these people were murdered is a disgrace for our whole society. Some Germans dared to protest publicly against the so-called euthanasia. The gassing was stopped but killing by injection and starvation continued secretly. As the war went on, the Nazis moved against the Jews in country after country and forced them to wear Stars of David as identification. In Poland, the process of human destruction began when the Jews were confined to ghettos. Bricked off from the outside world, the ghettos were filled to bursting and ridden with disease and hunger. In Warsaw, the Germans allowed themselves 2,300 calories a day. The Poles got about a thousand. Inside the ghetto walls, the ration for the Jews was 183 calories. This was forced starvation. A total of 600,000 died in the ghettos of Greater Germany. Jews worked if they could. They hoped that by making themselves indispensable to the German war economy, they might survive. Even some senior Nazis wondered if Germany shouldn't win the war before dealing with the Jews. But Berlin wasn't prepared to wait. More and more Jews were deported. Stuttgart, Germany, December 1941. 1,000 Jews from the city were given a last meal. They were advised to take tools and cooking pots and told they were going east for resettlement. Aryan Germans could not fail to notice what was happening all over the Third Reich. Peter Bielenberg had actively resisted the Nazis for eight years since his days as a law student. He viewed the deportation of the Jews with grave misgivings. My thought was that while they were fit and in as far as they were fit, they would be used as slave labor. And as far as they were not fit, they were probably exposed to cold and starvation and would probably uh, die that way. That indeed meant that I was aware of at least partial elimination of the Jews altogether. The decision to kill all Jews systematically 
the final solution had now been made. A sand dune on the Latvian coast at Libau, 1941. A German naval officer on leave with his own movie camera came across a place where Jews were being executed. As well as killing the local Jews, the Nazis brought thousands of German Jews to Latvia to be shot. The executioners didn't always wait for their victims to be brought to them. Mobile units, Einsatzgruppen, combed the countryside, looking for Jews to kill where they lived. A Shishki in Lithuania was home to 3,500 Jews. In September 1941, the Germans led them to pits outside the town and ordered them to undress. Zvi Mikhaili was 16 years old. When we all undressed, when I saw Rabbi Zushi undressed, I thought this was the end. The verses from the Psalms that he recited in our ears. Up to then, I'd been confident that we wouldn't die. And my father was saying, you will live, don't be afraid. You will live and take revenge. He put his left hand on me. I saw my brother David climbing up on his thigh, so tight. He clung so tight. He didn't let go of him until the last minute. And the shots of the machine gun. There was a mixture of voices, of people crying, and children, and the shots, and the dust. And everything mingled together. I found myself inside the pit. I felt my father give me a push, and then fall on top of me. <laughs> he covered me. He wanted me to live. Shootings took place in thousands of towns and villages. Jürgen Kroger was an interpreter for one of the execution squads. They said the Jews were an inferior race. One of them said to me, it's like having a rose bush, and the rose bush has got green fly on it. Then you have to get rid of the green fly. The Jews weren't human beings for them. It was like killing flies. Killing people wasn't nice work, as they said themselves, but it was necessary work. Ordinary Germans weren't told about the methods of the final solution, but the goal was stated in public. A Hanover newspaper in 1942 carried the heading, The Jews to be Exterminated. Hitler was quoted as saying, whatever this fight brings with it, this will be its final result. Jews were transported from all over occupied Europe. Hans Margulis had fled from Berlin. Caught by the Germans in Holland, he was forced to help with the deportations. We are at six in the morning, we had to fetch the people who were on the transport lists. 
we had to get them. And if they couldn't walk, we had to take them on stretchers to the trains. It was clear from the destination board that the train was going to Auschwitz. But he didn't know what Auschwitz was. No one had any idea that there were extermination camps. Otherwise, there would have been a panic and the process wouldn't have gone so smoothly. Here, people are saying goodbye. Some are on the outside. They're saying, we'll see each other again soon. The war won't last long. That's me. We had to shut the doors. The SS stood behind me and gave the orders. It was very difficult to say no. How could people in our position oppose an SS man? German state railways charged the SS for transporting the Jews using the third class group travel rate. Return tickets for the guards. One way for the Jews. The journey to the camps could take days. No sanitation, no food, little or no water. Many died on the way. When we arrived, we didn't know where we were. We suspected this was a place of death. We saw those chimneys. We saw the smoke from the chimneys. The sight made you shudder. This was going to be our fate. The camps were at the end of the line. Auschwitz in southern Poland was the largest. On the ramp between the tracks, new arrivals were divided into columns of men and women. Then a doctor selected those strong enough to work. The rest were to die immediately. Dora Schwartz and a group of mothers and children was sent on to the gas chamber. I was lucky. After the selection, another official saw me and pointed for me to go with the others, with the ones who were allowed to live. Because those mothers with children were immediately sent to the ovens. And so I passed from death to life. The SS photographed the selection of prisoners at Auschwitz during one day in 1944. Work squads of prisoners unloaded the wagons and sorted the belongings. Norbert Lopper from Vienna was a prisoner working on the ramp. These people were all sick and couldn't walk. We had to help them onto the lorries. They were then transported to the gas chambers. We had a trainload of children arrive from Theresienstadt. They had nurses with them. I can still remember how every child was holding a bread roll. And as they walked past, they had to leave their rolls in a basket. And they went hand in hand with the nurses into the gas chambers. The 
Hans Munk served as an SS doctor at Auschwitz. He refused to make selections, but he took part in the gassing of Jews just once. First, the chamber doors were closed. It was almost hermetically sealed. You could hardly hear anything. Then the Zyklon B gas was thrown in from the top, and the doctor, and on that occasion I took part, had to check after about 10 minutes to see if it was all over. There was a peephole there. You looked through the peephole, and if everyone was on the floor, then it was all right. Then the doors on the side closest to the crematoria were opened. Lorries drove up to take them away more easily. A photograph taken secretly by a prisoner shows the burning of bodies in the open air. So overworked were the Auschwitz crematoria in the summer of 1944. There were millions of victims of Nazi atrocities, but the biggest group by far was the six million Jews systematically killed because they didn't fit in with Germany's racial plan. Half a million gypsies were killed for the same reason. We couldn't work it out, why they did it. Why they treated us so badly and were so vicious. We couldn't understand it at all. Insgesamt aber können wir sagen, wir haben diese schwerste Aufgabe in Liebe zu unserem Volk getan. Und wir haben keinen Schaden in unserem Innern, in unserer Seele, in unserem Charakter daran genommen. As the war ended, the true cost of the Nazi delusion of a special racial destiny was exposed. As the camps were liberated, the local Germans were brought in. For 12 years, they'd sung the rousing songs, been stirred by their leader's rhetoric, and shared the glow of early military success. Now they could see the price, the corpses, the medical experiments, the lampshades made of human skin, the result of the attempt to create a master race. Visit the People's Century website at PBS Online. Add your story to People's Century. Hear more from people featured in tonight's program. And access key events through an interactive timeline. Seen so far. Um. <clears throat> want to immediately uh, feel shock. Um, I'm sure that you could see, however, the um, parallels to what we've read so far. 
Does anybody have any questions at this point? What we're going to do now, I'm sorry, yes? What, what you might think about the people who are interviewed um, and their telling of their experience. It's difficult to know whether that SS man was tried or not. I do know that um, a significant number of people were not tried for what they did. This uh, film raises, okay, raises issues about what is represented to us, um, especially in film, about the Holocaust. You have seen some very factual information here, and this is uh, obviously a documentary film. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to get myself over to where I need to be. Thanks, yes. Um, it's kind of a schizophrenic pres uh, presentation today. We felt it was very important that you see Master Race 1933, um, and I did tell you why, and that was because the images reinforce what you've already read. Um, did anybody have any other questions before we start now to talk about um, images of the Holocaust as portrayed um, in film? Okay. Um, I have a few uh, remarks I want to make. Obviously, most of what we have seen about the Holocaust, maybe not the faculty, but certainly, or maybe not the historians, but certainly you, has been film portrayals of what the Holocaust was like. So let me just do my quick survey. How many of you have seen The Pianist? Raise your hand high. And how many of you have seen Schindler's List? And how many of you have seen The Diary of Anne Frank? And how many of you have read Elie Wiesel's book, Night? And how many of you have read The Diary of Anne Frank? How many and, have and how many have not read any or seen any films about the Holocaust? For how many of you were these images the first time you had encountered a kind of logical explanation for the atrocities that happened during the war? First time. How many of you had seen documentary films? So those images were not particularly shocking to you, were they? How many people found them very shocking? How many of you found them to be not shocking because you had seen them before? Okay. Well, we need to start asking ourselves questions about the portrayal of um, the Holocaust in film. and to ask ourselves whether there are differences between documentaries and artistic interpretations. We have um, seen some footage from some of the documentaries that the Nazis produced. And um, one of the things that I wanted you to be aware of 
is that for the most part, images and documentaries come from Nazi sources. The victims had neither cameras nor film, and the killers filmed sequences in one ghetto or another to amuse themselves, or to bring souvenirs back to their families, or to serve the propaganda machine of Joseph Goebbels. The use of these images make it difficult to eliminate the poisonous message that motivated them. So what we see in these images is what the Nazis wanted us to see. There were some very disturbing images from the Warsaw Ghetto. Do you remember them in the film? One of a woman uh, walking, dazed, um, and then right after that, another woman walking, and very clearly she's got a dead baby in her arms. That was not meant to provoke sympathy. Those pictures were done, and those films were done to justify Nazi actions because of a people that were so degenerate. So I have a list of questions that I would like you, I'm gonna go through them real slowly. So I'd like you to write them either on a separate piece of paper or on the back of your um, attendance sheet so that you can have them to refer back to. When we watch any film, we need to ask ourselves, what are the filmmaker's goals? What, have, what do they intend for us to see? Is the filmmaker intending to move us? Is the filmmaker reflecting or observing? We need to wonder whether the camera can succeed in accurate portrayals. And we also need to ask whether the filmmaker challenge it, um, can challenge our understanding of events. One of the things that we run into when we study the Holocaust is that we think we know everything. We continually search for answers. And when it comes right down to it, unfortunately, many of us who have studied the Holocaust in any depth come to the end and realize that we can only reach a certain point of understanding. And I think um, one of the certainly most eloquent commentators on the subject of understanding the Holocaust is Elie Wiesel. And those, some of you know him as the author of Night and many other um, books about the Holocaust. He has chosen pretty much to fictionalize um, his commentary on the Holocaust. And I came across um, a quote of his that I'd like to leave you with before we see the last uh, images for today. And that is, Elie Wiesel, the author of Night, said, there are truths which can be communicated by the word. There are deeper truths that can be transmitted only by silence. And on another level, there are truths are those truths which cannot be expressed, not even by silence. And I think that summarizes his own understanding of the Holocaust. 
We're going to see a short bit from um, something that was done in the 1950s. It's uh, something that you have seen called The Diary of Anne Frank. It's the last scene. We're going to need the <coughs> lights off, Lauren. And then after that, you'll see another portrayal of Anne Frank's life. Too late. So we just wait here until we die. I can't stand it. I'll kill myself. For heaven's sake, stop it. I think you would be glad if I did. You want me to die. Whose fault is it we're here? We could have been safe in America, Switzerland. But no, no. You wouldn't leave when I wanted to. You couldn't leave your precious things, your furniture. That's right. Blame it all on me. It's all my fault. Your hat, your shoes. Oh, I never had anything I really wanted. Everything was for your pleasure. Look, Pater. Look at the sky. Aren't the clouds beautiful? Lovely, lovely day. You know what I do when I think I can't stand another minute of being cooped up? I think myself outside. I think I'm on a walk in the park where I used to go with father the crocus and the jonquils and the violets grow along the slopes. You know, the most wonderful part of thinking yourself outside You can have roses and violets and tulips all blooming in the same season. Isn't that wonderful? When I was outside, I used to take it all for granted. And now in here, I've just gone crazy about nature. I've just gone crazy. I think... If something doesn't happen soon, if we don't get out of here, I can't stand much more of this. I wish you had a religion, Pater. No, thanks. Not me. I don't mean you have to be orthodox or believe in heaven and hell and purgatory and things. I just mean some religion doesn't matter what, just to believe in something. When I think of all that's out there, the trees and flowers, and those seagulls, when I think of the dearness of you, Pater, And the goodness of the people we know, Mr. Crowler and me, the vegetable man, all of them risking their lives for us every day. When I think of these good things, I'm not afraid anymore. I find myself in God, and I think... That's, that's fine. When I begin to think... Well, get mad. Look at us. Hiding out here for two years. Not able to move. Caught like... Waiting for him to come and get us.
we're not the only people that have had to suffer. There have always been people that have had to. Sometimes one race, sometimes another. And yet... That doesn't make me feel any better. I know it's terrible trying to have any faith when people are doing such horrible... But you know what I sometimes think? I think the world may be going through a phase the way I was with Mother. It'll pass. Maybe not for hundreds of years, but someday. I still believe, in spite of everything, that people are really good at heart. I want to see something now, not a thousand years from now. But, Pater, if you'd only look at it as part of the great pattern, that we're just a little minute in life. <sighs> Listen to us, going at each other like a couple of stupid grown-ups. <laughs> look at the sky. Isn't it lovely? Someday, when we get outside again, I'm going to...
everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart. That is obviously the last scene in the diary of Anne Frank. Um, she is probably the most famous child of the 20th century. She is also probably the most famous victim. And the diary itself is a central text in our culture. Um, in this film, Anne Frank is largely stripped of her Jewishness and also, um, I would insist, taken completely out of the context of the Holocaust. I have a last um, excerpt to show you from um, something that I um, would highly recommend to you. It's simply called Anne Frank. It is a drama, docudrama. Um, it um, was produced in, and it doesn't have a date here, but I'm sure it's the mid to late 90s. And it was a two-part miniseries, and um, I have chosen to show you one short excerpt from it to try and make the point that you need to look very carefully and closely, certainly in other things, but in this particular um, set of instances at what the filmmakers are trying to tell you and what images and ideas they leave you with. Okay, thank you, yes. Relive the magic.
afraid that your family is sick. So we're not going to be changed after all. Why are they so cool? You're the only person I've ever really talked to. You and the girl. She's not going to be able to understand you. Don't understand.
somewhere. portrayal is based on uh, fact. Um, there are many books now about uh, reminiscence uh, and memories of young friends of Anne Frank's. Um, it's terribly moving, but it's the truth. It's, it's closer to reality than what we saw in that first instance, and in that first instance, that is the image of Anne Frank that we have been left with. And unfortunately, it is our hard task to know what really happened. Um, but I would like you to remember and ask yourself when you see some of the portrayals and you think back to what you've seen today, to ask yourself in that first portrayal of Anne Frank, what the authors and the filmmakers were wanting to convey to you about Anne Frank and how it contrasts so drastically from what her real experience was. I hope you'll have some rich discussions on Thursday. Um, we'll see you then.
Thank you.